On today's episode, the finale of Starship Season 1 brings high-speed excitement, spectacular views, and a typical dose of confusion along the way. Let's start off by acknowledging how sick these new renders of the human landing system Starship really are. The first official update to the design that we've seen in a little while now. Noticeably absent are the solar panels from the exterior of the ship, but we can see the outline of these rectangular doors that are above the NASA logo and below the windows, which would line up with some previous renderings we've seen that showed four deployable solar arrays that kind of come out and then drop down alongside the body. We can see that the landing thrusters are still in the same position and we get a little better idea of what the landing gear might look like and how it deploys. We can see two iterations of the Lunar Starship here, basically one with a few windows and one with a lot of windows. The short term Artemis 3 moon lander and the future starships that will service moon base alpha. Moving on to Mars, SpaceX talks a bit about how they are preparing the ship for the first mission to Mars in 2026. They've been doing some practical tests of the heat shield material to deal with the Mars atmosphere entry. The livestream presenters point out something really interesting here. The composition of the Martian atmosphere is much different from the Earth. Not only is it a lot thinner, it's also almost entirely CO2, which is going to burn up into plasma a lot differently than the nitrogen in an oxygen-based atmosphere of Earth. The CO2 will create a lot of atomic oxygen, which is a highly reactive and energetic gas. It's mostly found in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, and it's something that we have to shield all of our satellites and space vehicles against. The higher reactive nature basically means that things will oxidize a lot faster. Chemical bonds are going to break down, and it could cause a lot more erosion on the heat shield than what we've seen on an Earth re-entry. Anyway, that's why space SpaceX is blasting their heat shield tiles in this crazy jet furnace. Moving back to the main event, we have the final launch of the Block 1 classic Starship upper stage design, and SpaceX made the decision to send it off with a test that would truly push the limits of what this hardware can do. They specifically mentioned that the ship has to perform better than anticipated just to survive this re-entry and make a successful controlled water landing, which this time around will happen on the daylight side of the Earth, so we get a very clear view of a potentially disastrous experiment. There are two big changes that have been made. One is the ship's heat shield tiles. SpaceX has removed 2100 of them. This was done on the sides of the rocket in between the top flaps and the lower flaps. You can see this pretty clearly, it kind of looks like a receding hairline on the side of the rocket. In addition, there are also tiles removed from the nose cone section and replaced with a secondary protective layer, also some tiles that have been covered with a layer of stainless steel. It's worth noting that the heat shield on this ship was not upgraded to the latest material that we saw on Flight 5. That ship got a whole new heat shield prior to launch. This one did not. It only had its heat shield weakened, and quite severely too. SpaceX is doing this to really test the resilience of the stainless steel material. If they're going to install catch hardware on the side of the ship on later flights, then they'll need to remove heat shield tiles in order to do that, so we might as well just get it over with now and see what happens. Again, this is the final Block 1 ship. It's the most expendable out of anything in their current fleet. And the big change number two is in the flight profile. If the ship manages to survive re-entry with this severely compromised and outdated heat shield, then it has to complete a drastic feat of aerobatics. They want to increase the angle of attack as the ship is coasting towards the ground at a subsonic speed. Typically, we see the ship perform a belly flop straight down through the air like a skydiver, but this time around, SpaceX wants to know what happens when they increase the angle of attack, meaning they point the nose down towards the ground. The team says this will be critical in the future when the ship returns to the launch site. Going nose down gives them more cross-range capability, but it also puts a lot more stress on the vehicle's control flaps. So knowing all of this, it seemed very likely that the ship was going to break at some point on the way down. 
Okay, let's talk liftoff. Everything went very smoothly. We had a fast, clean departure from the launch pad, all booster engines are healthy, and this is starting to look pretty routine at this point. It's still awesome though, and it was cool to see a different perspective on the launch with the late afternoon sun really beating down. That definitely made for better visibility throughout the ascent. I kind of prefer the sunrise vibes though, that's just personally. Now, even though the launch appeared clean, something did go wrong on the way up. I've got a tech-related problem that I know some of my fellow space enthusiasts can relate to. I often get lost in a wormhole of space documentaries, watching for hours, and my ears end up hurting because my headphones are just too tight. So I'm going to use Perplexity, an answer engine that's like having a personal shopping assistant right on my phone. It searches the internet in real time to find the best options and explains everything in simple terms. Just look at this. I type in over-ear headphones that are comfortable and don't squeeze your ears. Perplexity pulls up a list of options complete with prices, comparisons, and links to buy directly in the app. It's great because I don't have to open multiple tabs or dig through tons of reviews. I can actually see all my options side by side with clear explanations on what makes each one unique. This feature is perfect for tech gear, gift shopping, you name it. And just like that, I can go from a quick search to making a purchase in one tap. Perplexity doesn't just answer questions, it makes the entire shopping journey smooth, especially when you're trying to find something super specific. So if you're hunting for the right tech gear or just need gift ideas for someone who's impossible to shop for, give Perplexity a try. Just remember, it's about the journey, not the destination, and you might find exactly what you need along the way. After stage separation and the boost back burn, we get the call out for booster offshore divert, which means that there is no booster catch happening at the Mechazilla today. Super Heavy is on course for splashdown in the waters of the Gulf. At this point, I can't tell you for sure what happened, but I've got two potential early indicators. One, this communications antenna on top of the launch tower was bent over a bit after the launch. I don't really think that was the problem, but it is bent and it probably wouldn't be up there if it wasn't important, so that's one factor. Number two is potentially more damning. At T plus 2 minutes 54 seconds on the livestream clock, we get this view from the Super Heavy Booster, and we've seen this many times before, but I don't recall ever seeing the end of a pipe sticking out in the top of the frame. I don't know what that is, but I'm going to assume that it shouldn't be out there. Either way, the booster actually performed a very clean water landing. We saw much less fire involved this time around. The SpaceX stream cuts away as the booster peacefully tips over. There are other camera angles out there that showed it erupting into flames just seconds later, but that's to be expected with a bunch of rocket fuel sloshing around and flammable gases and very hot engines. Fire is inevitable at that point. This is probably a good time to shout out the first ever payload carried into space by a starship rocket, a banana. Not a real banana, that would explode in the vacuum of space, all the moisture inside the fruit would vaporize and expand and it would burst. Which would be cool to watch, but maybe a little disturbing at the same time. Anyway, this banana was stuffed, as in with foam, which is tradition on space flights to bring along a stuffed object to act as a zero-g indicator. You want something that can float around without taking anybody's eye out. This stuffed banana was also strapped down with some ropes so that it wouldn't float too far, but I wish that they hadn't tied it down as tight, it didn't really seem to be moving at all. But we do get a good view of the framework for the Starlink Pez Dispenser machine. SpaceX says that they hope to be deploying the first Starlink payload with Starship next year. Speaking of which, the big test for the coast phase of this flight is a Raptor engine relight. SpaceX wants to prove that the engine can refire in the microgravity vacuum environment. This is going to be critical in allowing them to slow down on future missions where they fly at higher altitudes and more stable orbits. So we see one of the center three Raptors fire up for just a few seconds and that's what they called a successful test. And then coasting around the Earth was a much different experience this time around. The ship very quickly passed into the night side of the Earth, so we couldn't see very much for the majority of the time it was up there, but we did get this very fascinating overhead view of a giant thunderstorm raging over Africa. That was really cool. 
The ship's re-entry began in darkness, but then slowly transitioned into daylight, the opposite of what we're used to seeing by now, which is a very nice change. I might prefer the sunrise launch, but the daylight re-entry is just much more exhilarating. You see so much more detail on the ship as it heats up and sparks fly off, and yet again, some parts of the front flap did melt away. But not much. Overall, the ship performed really well, all things considered. You can see that the bare steel sections of the ship that were exposed under the removed tiles did wrinkle and deform a little bit, but overall the ship held up through peak heating and maximum aerodynamic stress. We definitely lost some heat shield tiles, these old ones don't stick as well as the new variety, but the ship came down in one piece and it even performed the nosedive. Just a brief push down towards the ground as the ship passed through the upper cloud layer, but you could get a really strong sense of just how much more intense the aerodynamic dynamic forces were. Then we get our first ever really clear, well-lit views of the engine relight and the flip maneuver from on board the ship. Then we cut to the buoy cam to show a nice, clean, controlled landing and the splashdown. The ship still did catch fire after it tipped over, but again, much smaller fireball than what we've seen before, so that's probably good news. Unfortunately, I believe that our banana passenger didn't make it. Okay, now what? Up next is the first flight of Starship Block 2. We got our first really good look at this machine during the pre-launch stream. It's just a little bit longer than the classic ship, and most of that space is being taken up by the fuel tanks. It's going to allow the Block 2 ship to carry over 100 metric tons of payload into low Earth orbit. It was never really confirmed how much mass the Block 1 ship could have handled if SpaceX had ever tried, but probably not very much. The one down side I would point out about Block 2 is that you can see the payload bay is smaller than Block 1. When the ship is fueled, it's very clear by the frost lines where the propellant tank ends and the payload bay begins. We have to also remember that there are header tanks up inside the nose cone, so that's not open space up at the top either. That means Starship Block 2 has a very wide cargo bay, but it's not as tall as what we used to think that it would be. It's still pretty tall though. Now, with the Raptor engine relight proven, and that new capability from Block 2, it's almost certain that Starship is going all the way to orbit on their next flight. There's a lot of debate about the technicalities of orbit going on, but SpaceX themselves have been calling these early flights suborbital, so for the next flight profile we are going faster and higher to achieve a true orbit all the way around the world, which means that the ship then needs to slow itself down before it can re-enter the atmosphere. That's going to be a lot of fun to watch, so stay tuned.